KPN is obviously a Dutch telecommunications uh, company. KPN serves consumers, businesses, clients via wholesale, and sometimes even countries. So in this case, the Netherlands. Innovation is something that everyone should be working on. It can never sit in just one place. Everyone should be part. It's the dance floor wherein you ask everyone to dance. Innovation is our oxygen to move us forward and we're driving innovation because by telcos driving innovation, other companies, other consumers, other clients can really utilize those innovations for their innovative uh, strategies as well. This is Serna TV, my name is Hendrik Dekkers. I'm here today with Arti Debedin, who is the CIO at KPN. A very warm welcome, Arti. Thank you. Arti, you have quite a number of degrees and certificates from top schools like Harvard. You studied uh, digital technology at MIT and global politics at Yale. You have a career of 25 years in IT and most of it in the finance industry, banking and insurance. You started at Delta Lloyd uh, Bank. And, uh, and after that, you went into a couple of startups like Knapbank here in the Netherlands. Uh, but you also worked for large banks like NIBC uh, Group, where you were the CIO and uh, you were also the international CIO at NN Group. Uh, May 2022, you switched sector and we'll talk about that uh, later, of course. Uh, and you became CIO and EVP here at uh, KPN, where we are today in uh, Rotterdam. So, Arti, tell us a little bit more uh, about yourself and let's start with the business side. What, is, what are your functionalities today uh, and how is KPN organized? What is it that KPN really stands for? Yeah, well, KPN is obviously a Dutch telecommunications mm -hmm. uh, company. Uh, even though Dutch, they make a lot of impact on a global scale and win mm -hmm. a lot of awards. So they're actually uh, really, really the leading telco. So mm -hmm. uh, KPN serves consumers, businesses, mm -hmm clients via wholesale mm -hmm. and uh, and sometimes even countries so in this case the netherlands mm -hmm. yeah okay and you're responsible uh, as cio for which parts of the business as so my position is cio for consumer wholesale and the enterprise uh -huh. the uh, total enterprise and there's another cio within uh, kpn and he's responsible for the b2b side okay yeah so everything that is B2C and enterprise and so on yeah. is, uh, is yours. So that's, the, the yeah. I think, a big, big part of KPN, yeah. right? Yeah, the uh, largest part, I yeah. think, a consumer, a wholesale and enterprise. Yeah. Um, I think the largest part. And how big is KPN in total in number of people? 11,000. 11,000, okay. Yeah. Um, so that's quite an organization, I it's can imagine. It's quite an organization. Yeah. Uh, it used to be so much bigger, though. Oh, yeah. yeah, so it's... Uh, uh, today, we're doing the same as we were doing. So uh, mm -hmm. we are we really made the move to a more uh, nimble organization. Okay. Yeah. So let's talk about... Let's start with the business itself. Telco is... It's, I mean, it's becoming a pure tech play uh, uh, sector, of course, today. So what is, uh, in your view, what are the main challenges that KPN and a telco in general are uh, are faced with today. Yeah, yeah. This is what really triggers me, and what really I th think that drives me uh, into thinking of the future of telecommunications, because you, we have all seen just mm -hmm. in the pandemic and after it, right after it, how much importance it is to be connected, mm -hmm. to have speed in connections, yeah. to really utilize the connections to all of the use cases in daily lives. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, we not only only used it in our professional lives with everything in our human interactions and behavior switching to online but also in our personal lives mm -hmm. so this is really interesting in the in the past yep. the economic value that telco industry has lost to tech players mm -hmm. now we again because of the foundations of connections infrastructure network mobile mm -hmm. and everything that's there uh, really th there's a, a real opportunity to get back in reinventing ourselves and yep. trying to really utilize technology uh, for 
an enhancement and advancement mm -hmm. of digitization getting into end-to-end -end, yeah. uh, people's lives and making it easier. Yeah. yeah, so I can imagine that an environment like KPM, telco company, is under constant change, right? Yeah. Uh, so uh, it went into mobile and data and, 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 and so on and so on, fiber. and Broadband, and so fiber. The, yeah. So yeah. there's so many, many new technologies that yeah. arrive here uh, at the same time and also probably in media and, and, and so on. So exactly. many, many different plays. So it's a, it's a company that is always, is a sector always on the move, yeah. uh, looking for the next opportunities as well. Yeah. Um, so I can imagine that that must be a very fun uh, environment to be working in but at the same time we live in special times so there's uh, there's pressure on budgets i can imagine there's pressure on on on, on global economy there's um, a global instability politically and so on and so on so is there still room here at kpn for innovation because that's the main topic that i would like to discuss uh, yeah. with you today and 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 how would you uh, see what what was the business innovation that you see is most important at the moment? Yeah, so uh, circling back to your introduction first, that obviously the foundations and the fundamentals are changing and innovating. Mm -hmm. eh? You move from 4G to 5G yep. to uh, XG, yep. and you have to really move forward with mm -hmm. this. And this is not something you can make a conscious co choice. Uh, we're go going with the innovation or without it. It's going to come anyway. So the foundations and the leading telco side yep. will always grow to new innovative technologies and mm -hmm. connections yep. uh, to build on mm -hmm. and also the next phase is to build all the digitizations and digital use cases on top mm -hmm. and then I think TV for instance and OTT is in the middle so a lot of innovations that happen there uh, either on the technology part of mm -hmm. it of, or the digitization part of it is super interesting because yep. uh, innovation is uh, I think for us our, our oxygen Oxygen to move us forward and we're driving innovation because by telcos driving innovation other companies other consumers other clients other companies can really utilize those innovations for their yep. uh, innovative uh, strategies as well yep. yeah now we're going to talk about a couple of examples on where uh, you're really innovating and bringing new um, uh, services uh, yeah. to the market and to uh, to your clients but maybe let's first look at it from a, a bit of an abstract view um, in a big uh, telco company like this, what is, uh, what is the innovation model? Uh, because I can imagine everybody is innovation, everybody needs to uh, come up with new ideas, but, but in, in reality, how is innovation organized? How, what's, yeah. what's the model to make sure that you're on the forefront of this? Yeah, so this is, uh, as you were saying in my introduction, I studied disruptive and sustainable innovation mm -hmm. at Harvard, mm -hmm. uh, which was one of the nicest, um, really one of the nicest uh, degrees I, I, I had accomplished or attained, but also the nicest courses, mm -hmm. the nicest studies that I did with the nicest professors mm -hmm. that were so ahead of time. Yeah. Uh, so people often think that uh, since in the media we often Often speak about disruptive innovation but disruptive innovation really does not happen all the time mm -hmm. it, it is it, it really happens uh, once every uh, decades yeah so many years but sustainable innovation is something that happened every week every month mm -hmm. every year and the sustainable innovation part means that you have to improve and reinvent whatever services you have there. Yeah. So either your your uh, the ways you uh, connect the whole Netherlands, mm -hmm. the way you are building uh, your company services for a sustainable future for a cu customer, clients, and companies, yeah. and also the way you try to make social impact. That means that you try to think from the customer, mm -hmm. companies and clients that you work and the social impact you can make and then circle it back mm -hmm. to, okay, we already have these uh, these services in uh, technology is shifting. Yep. Uh, as I said, the most maybe um, 
uh, clear uh, changes uh, moving from 3G, 4G, 5G to XG, or uh, the way, the speed that we require for con connectivity, yep. uh, but others as well. TV, OTT is a really interesting part, yep. or digitization. How do you connect with the world via web, app, and, and so on? But then you have to think of, if I can make mm -hmm. uh, my products and my services and my interaction and engagement with customers every year better than mm -hmm. the year before, yeah. that's called sustainable innovation. Mm -hmm. And that's the way you win the hearts and minds of your customers, your yeah. companies and clients that you work for. And also you win and earn um, the loyalty of your customers and mm -hmm. your clients. And that has the biggest chance of surviving. Companies mm -hmm. like uh, company uh, KPM will always go for sustainable innovation and innovating year over year yeah. and getting closer to their consumers uh, year over year uh, rather than to think of the golden egg yeah. uh, that, that's not there. Yeah. Some companies, they have an innovation department. Uh, some companies have um, started incubating centers and yeah. working a lot of, with startups. Uh, some companies give everybody 20% of free time to go and do crazy stuff and see yeah. what comes out of it. So there's a lot of different models that companies yeah. are, are, are using. What are the what are the practical ways that, that yeah. you organize it here? Yeah, so the strong conviction that I personally have is mm -hmm. that innovation is something that everyone should be working on. So thinking of how to innovate yourself, how to reinvent yourself, your team, the services, your deliveries, but also your company as a whole, your products, uh, the way you interact and everything. Uh, so it can never sit in just one place. Mm -hmm. Everyone should be part. Yeah. It's, a, it's, it's the dance floor where you ask everyone to dance mm -hmm. uh, and everyone on the, uh, should be there doing their own dance. Within KPN, we, ha we do have an innovation board, mm -hmm. but that innovation board is connecting everyone in our companies with, mm -hmm. uh, via stakeholders and also the intention of every uh, department. I think also this is the power of KPN that Every department is really moving forward mm -hmm. and you can only move forward in such a speed that you don't leave something behind. Yeah. Uh, so you also have to clean up the clutter, you have to clean up your legacy because that's how you move forward yeah. faster. Yeah. yeah. I also can imagine that, I mean, it's a tech company, right? It's so, a tech company. Uh, you're in a tech company, so that means every innovation has... has at its core is digital, right? Yeah. So that means that as a CIO and your IT teams, they're involved in, in all this new development that's yeah. going on. So how does that translate? And, and how is that, that collaboration working between business innovation and how does that then translate into... In, in, so how is the handover yeah. from business ideas and concept and innovation to digital? Yeah, well, this is so, so attractive. Uh, topic to speak mm -hmm. about because in a company such as KPN, the business is technology. Yeah. That is your core business. Your core business is technology, digital, data. But yeah, technology, digital and data is nothing without the value to your uh, customers mm -hmm. and your clients. Uh, so you have to think outside in. And then in our uh, company, this alignment that you're thinking of, so uh, you, you could perceive the business as being sales and marketing and mm -hmm. the one thing thinking of new uh, product management or but and you could perceive uh, uh, technology as we are uh, this uh, KPN is a technology company mm -hmm. so you have to structure the intersection and how you no. uh, move forward with each other but it's really really interested that mm -hmm. interesting that in this case technology is the business and uh, sales and marketing is also a tech savvy department so yeah. everyone speaks the, the the same language and you move forward with each other in the same way okay let's talk about a couple of, of innovation programs that have been implemented here in the company uh, lately and i understand you, you uh, organize this by experience different experience teams yeah so maybe let's let's start. I understand there's a media experience team. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that and what they do. Yeah, I thought it was smart 
to, and I've done this also with other companies, such mm -hmm. as with NIBC, but also at Knobank. I thought it was smart to name your department well, in the same way or a sentence that gives you a clue what the purpose of the department is. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, media experience is there, and media experience, well, it's, it's obviously for everyone, it's clear what media experience delivers. Yeah. So that's uh, the TV part and so on. OTT, yeah. broadcasting. And then digital experience mm -hmm. is really responsible for the experience of digital mm -hmm. to all of our stakeholders yeah. and also ourselves. And then uh, business technology excellence means that the business technologies platforms should really be excellent in such a way mm -hmm. that you have that operational excellence that everyone is striving for. Yeah. And then we have our uh, departments called enterprise excellence, mm -hmm. because in an enterprise, you want people to not have procedures, policies, and, and how do you say, processes, mm -hmm. but you really want to have an employee experience and an enterprise experience that is lean and digital as well. And my, my fifth department is called TechBase. Mm -hmm. I love that name. But TechBase excellence really is the uh, the team that is using cloud technology and using the best engineering capabilities and competences to really help the whole organization move forward with okay. cloud technology, but also with engineering culture and craftsmanship throughout the whole organization. Okay. Yeah. So let's maybe take a couple of examples from these yeah. five um, groups. What's the, what's cooking there? What is special what can you share with us what is exciting yeah, so uh, what is known is last year for instance media experience has delivered uh, tv without uh, hardware and really tv uh, gamings and apps uh, with a click on a uh, on a remote on your tv mm -hmm. uh, imagine us coming in with the android tv apps and and players coming in uh, using connectivity in mm -hmm. people's homes via their tv yeah. so tv and also combining it with uh, all of the OTTs, Disney, Netflix, everything, HBO, Amazon, everything that we have. It's really nice that we made that shift and it's really uh, the best uh, experience right now. And for instance, digital experience last year has uh, delivered everything multi-SIM, everything e-SIM, every uh, customer engagement process and all the flows to really have that digital experience for our consumers. Uh, enterprise experience really delivered an end-to-end -end, uh, by use of modern technologies, seamless flow of the enterprise processes that you have, whether it's on finance, on HR, um, and TechBase really made the moves to cloud. So we really shifted from uh, uh, traditional infrastructures because you have to move with the software and the applications that you have yeah. and the platforms that you have, make the real move on this huge scale yeah. uh, towards cloud. And I really love that, not just cloud, but really utilizing cloud technology because everyone can move to cloud, mm -hmm. but can you really reap the benefits yeah. of being in the cloud? I really love that. So there's lots of this happening and I'm obviously not the the only one working in uh, technology within KPM, we have a huge department. Mm -hmm. It's called TDO, uh, so technology and uh, and digital office. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of colleagues of mine uh, that really bring that, uh, whether it's on networks, on mobile, on fixed, or on convergence, or on um, fiber, bringing that, um, th that forward-looking vision and strategy and bringing those programs programs in the benefits of our uh, stakeholders. Yeah. So 11,000 people, they're all in tech. There's lots of change going on, um, but changing is difficult. I mean, innovating is not an easy thing. Yeah. Transforming is not an easy thing. Digital transformation is not an easy thing. So where do you see uh, in general and here in KPN, what are the major challenges? And because speed is everything. So coming up quickly with these new services yeah. and ideas and implementing them. So where do you see the main challenges 
to innovate faster and how, and how do you address these challenges? Yeah, it's really boring, but sometimes mm -hmm. you have to structure this mm -hmm. uh, because uh, the, the, the core culture within KPN is everyone is really entrepreneurial, mm -hmm. everyone is tech savvy, everyone is moving forward with this. Uh, the business of technology is our business. Uh, so lots of things happening, lots of ideas, lots mm -hmm. of value we bring, whether it's on IoT or on AI or on data, on digital, on uh, really on connectivity, on networks, on infrastructure, yep. B2B, a little bit of structure there. So I love the fact that the, uh, the corporate strategy is connected to the TDO, so the technology and digital strategy is connected to the IT strategies. Yeah. I love the fact that there's a connection and a structure yeah. uh, throughout the whole enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. So I can imagine that there's a demand for a million new things, right? And so how do you as a CIO, together with your C-suite colleagues, how do you set your priorities? Yeah. Because that, that's an important thing. You cannot yeah. invest in everything at the same time. So yeah. how do you prioritize where you're going to create new value? Yeah. Again, a blue answer or a rational <laughs> answer, really a little bit boring. But... Uh, I think uh, that a lot of companies, not just us, a lot of companies can really understand, okay, let's prioritize portfolio mm -hmm. of what we are doing. And also let's uh, really understand the value, the benefits, and make that TCO analysis mm -hmm. of what we're going to do yep. and focus on what brings the majority of the value and sometimes even make that fast decision-making in stopping other initiatives. You really have to prioritize and prioritize prioritize across the organization. This is really important, I think. And also in my organization, it's really difficult to do this because we are working in an agile way. We were, are working in a DevOps way. That means that, for instance, maybe 12 buckets of work, whether it's on operations or it's on uh, uh, reducing legacy or it's on improving a process or it's in optimizing uh, some services, whatever it is, all of these buckets come together. And even though you make uh, priorities on another level, mm -hmm. abstraction level, then it's hard for an engineer to see, I am responsible for everything. So I need traffic leaders saying, mm -hmm which of the traffic should go first and how do you marry this oh. with connected uh, departments? Artie, innovation in many organizations uh, not only happens uh, at the core of the company, but uh, many times at the, uh, at the edges uh, of the company, uh, where you collaborate with maybe startups and, 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 and other players in the market. So at, Telco companies have the opportunity to become ecosystems and to become platform players. What is the strategy, uh, your strategy and KPM uh, strategy in that? Well, it has to be, uh, uh, because you cannot be internal focused. As I was saying, that our core uh, a core DNA or core um, business or core quality is to deliver co connectivity, mm -hmm. buy that connectivity, make a social impact. Having that social impact means that you have to work with either other sectors mm -hmm. or other companies or better players yeah. in your whole ecosystem. So uh, I am really confident that, for instance, the teacher is still there, but his work is easier by connectivity mm -hmm. and by digitization. Yeah. If you want to change a whole sector, then, for instance, health, uh, the doctor is still there, but his role has not changed. Uh, the way he works has changed. So bringing that whole uh, sector change by means of connectivity and by means of digitization, yeah. we have to think outside our company. Great. Yeah. So that paints us a little bit the picture, I think, how innovation is important, how it's done and, and implemented here at uh, KPN. There's, there's two aspects of two, let's say, technology uh, roadmaps or uh, important categories of technologies that I think play a very important role also in driving innovation. Yeah. AI is one of them. Automation is another one. So let's talk a little bit more about AI. I mean, we now live in the months where everybody's uh, crazy about uh, GPT-4 coming out and generative AI and so on. So where do you, where do you, how do you look at AI in general? 
I mean, AI has been around for some time. It really? It has gone through winters and summers, and yeah. we're in a new spring and, and summer. So true. Yeah. So how, where do you see um, AI in the, in the big context, in the big picture? What is your view on AI today? So today we use AI, for instance, to um, prevent churn or to improve how we interact with our customers mm -hmm. or how to know what our customer wants before they ask for it yep. because you could really understand their behavior yep. uh, online or to increase uh, the time to market for credits or for uh, to really be speedy about fraud prevention or mm. security hazards yeah. or whatever that is. So uh, today we already use and utilize AI for this, mm. which is also out there because as you were saying, I totally agree that AI as a te technology has been here for decades. Yeah. Uh, understanding the technology is what we spend a lot of time with. Uh, mm. And also in the S-curve, you can now see that the te technology is um, demystified. Mm -hmm. he, also with chat GPT, it's yeah. demystified. So on top, you can now really have a democratic view on it. I remember a decade ago, we were afraid in the market, public market, uh, about AI. Is it ethical? Mm -hmm. Are we using it prudently? Yeah. Is it uh, instead of bringing us um, more security or uh, identification authorization, mm -hmm. um, safety, is it not breaching our security levels? And now today you can see that that has shifted yeah. by a lot of uh, exposure yeah. that AI has also in always, it's always um, brought forward because mm -hmm. of something happening in the public space. Mm -hmm. And then it, it shifts the narrative yeah. on professions, uh, professional side. Yeah, but at the same time, it looks now that we have crossed the tipping point, I would say, in AI. I mean, some people now have um, uh, signed open letters and say, well, let's first put some regulation in place before yeah. we further have these uh, massive language uh, models and, and, and so on. Because there is a danger, an inherent danger in, yeah. in if, if AI is not um, transparent, if it's not human-centered enough, yeah. there's a danger in there as well. So, so what, what's, what's your totally view on that? I totally agree. I really think that it's a balancing act between two things. Mm -hmm. If it is um, uh, safety and security and privacy, mm -hmm. and that's on a scale with the benefits for you mm -hmm. and the value it brings, then if the value and the benefits is unclear, mm -hmm. you're always afraid of the intrusion and the breaches and you have something perceived safety mm -hmm. and perceived uh, security and perceived and then something comes that yeah. opens it up because the real power of AI is open AI mm -hmm. as chat GPT is open AI mm -hmm. and that's from no one it's so it's opening up that whole system which is scary it's mm -hmm. a so it's a scary phase you enter yeah until the value is clear. Mm -hmm. And I think ChatGPT is one of the first uh, use cases wherein the value is out there. There are people writing their papers for their mm -hmm. studies by use of ChatGPT. Yeah. I also injured myself a few months ago and then used ChatGPT to understand my whole recovery time. Mm -hmm. I really tried to use the, yeah. uh, the, the system to understand my recovery time. So is yeah. it already in people's lives? Mm -hmm. their daily life and it's accepted and the value for us as citizens and consumers will be will increase then the skill is more in balance yeah. and of course regulation should be there and laws should be there but sometimes yeah. law and regulators do not understand how to no no they don't know that they don't have a clue how to do it today <laughs> yeah. And that's why we maybe need to put, uh, push the pause button for a moment uh, because yeah. some people uh, would say that the impact that AI is going to have in the next five, ten years is comparable to the impact that the internet yeah, has I, starting I, I, 20 I years ago. So. Yeah. I do think so. I do think that by democratizing something and demystifying mm -hmm. something and also, for instance, do you remember uh, in uh, the 90s when everyone had Windows 95 at home, then they demanded their, uh, their older network systems in companies because they would, from a private space and home office, 
go to the uh, the corporate office and think, why are things so slow here? Because at my house, I have office and I have Windows 95 and super speedy and I have cool new notebooks. And then you enter into the corporate world and you don't see that. And, and this is the same thing. I think that now that it's democratized more and it's demystified more and we see use cases in our daily lives, mm -hmm. our children will use it, we will use it. And it's also hidden in all of our use cases, yeah. how, in our human behaviors, then obviously it's going to also change the services provided by uh, companies and corporates towards others. I understand. I mean, in, in preparing this interview, you told me about your IoT devices and that AI can play a role in that as well. Can you la yeah. elaborate on that? Well, same thing. So uh, obviously we are in the business of connectivity mm -hmm. and digitization. That's our core. And uh, we have a huge and very thriving uh, department uh, that is bringing uh, connectivity and uh, IoT mm -hmm. um, for bikes, for uh, devices, for drones, for and you can have super cool use cases for that, uh, even if it's uh, changing man channels, which you have in so many sectors, or changing uh, uh, vehicles and devices and really understanding uh, where they are and really try to use AI and also I IoT to see the behaviors and also to prevent, for instance, uh, the theft or damages and and that sort of things. Yeah. It's really cool because the same thing that Tesla has in their cars, if you walk around it, mm -hmm. you can see that somebody walk uh, is walking around your car yeah. and then a snippet is made and captured so you can watch back yeah, uh, who's, it who it was for yeah. theft and damages. Uh, IoT and the combination with connectivity, with the combination of AI and data, has a lot of use cases yeah. uh, that are similar to that. Inside IT, how do you look at the, the role of generative uh, AI? I mean, are we now finally entering the stage where software code will write itself and, and, and we will have... Uh, the need for hardcore developers is going to decrease dramatically? I don't think so. And because uh, I think it always takes time. Uh, and it's always... Um, so the fact that it's an... It's entering our daily lives, mm -hmm. that's going to shift the needle. Mm -hmm. And the fact that it's going to be something that we perceive now as normal and not scary, that's going to shift the needle. Mm -hmm. But will it immediately change our jobs or change uh, or reduce our jobs? I think that's going to be um, slower. Mm -hmm. uh, I do think that we already on ourselves, you can wait until something happens to you or you can be, be the one that drives that change. Yeah. Driving that change means that I have huge, huge teams that have automated huge level of their activities mm -hmm. because they really want to, to move forward yeah. and moving forward to be, be having more impact and being mm -hmm. more innovative effectively means that the, uh, the jobs to be done that are there by repetition, mm -hmm. you have to automate. Yeah. And we used scarcity to make those decisions and really automate it, build self-healing systems, move up the ladders, because we wanted to be more on the uh, innovative, making impact, collaborating with colleagues and building new services and products mm -hmm. side. I think that's a good behavior. If you can find that mentality in your organization where you don't wait until something happens to you, yeah. but you drive that change and really also in your all of the buckets, you try to analyze the activities, the jobs to be done that you can automate that immediately sh shifts you uh, forward. Yeah. Let's talk about, I mean, in, in a telco company, there's a huge demand for innovation. You need to reinvent the business yes. every so many years, come up with new services. I mean, it's a highly competitive environment. Yeah. Um, so that means that um, you also, and, and AI is, and, and advanced analytics and so on is, is so, so important. Working with data, the huge amounts of data that come in from all your different devices and so on. So, so let's talk a little bit about your um, your people in that domain, the data scientists, and, yeah. and how is that organized here at, at KPN? Is, is data science 
a department in IT? Is that a separate department? Are there groups that are well, spread everywhere? Well, this is a nice story to tell because my uh, colleague is uh, the chief data officer mm -hmm. and he has a dual function as I have a dual oh. function. I work in technology, but I also work in consumer wholesale and enterprise. So I sit in the boards of consumer wholesale and enterprise and also the boards on the, on technology. So mm -hmm. we, we are in the same leadership teams. And I think connecting those worlds really helps you, but it's also... It's also challenging. The same for the chief data officer. He works in technology and he also works in uh, in the business side of things. And that's really nice because obviously data is such a container phrase. They, there are so many types of data yeah. and uh, there are so many, how do you say, uh, larger Analy analytics to done uh, to be done on the data because you have to think of uh, combining data and sorts of data and, and, and systems uh, where data sit to imagine how it could affect uh, use cases on the customer and consumer side. But then you also need data and a real data strategy mm -hmm. to improve your um, time to market on the digital and digitization yeah. side. And you also need it for operational excellence. And you also need it nah, and so on, for yeah. data quality, for data performance. There is no digital without data. Yeah. And so it's really nice that within KPN, it's the first time I've seen this, that people sit in multiple teams connecting mm -hmm. those worlds and building b okay. bridges. But there's a separate chief data officer with his data teams and data scientists and yeah. so on. Because I can't imagine that's super, super important to have yeah. top talent in there and, yeah. and make sure that you're on the forefront and not, not that, that you're leading in, uh, in, in this way as well. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, super. So, I mean, we could continue to talk about AI for, uh, for much, much longer. Yeah. But, but let's talk about automation, about uh, software robots, robotic process automation. Yeah. There's a whole new wave of technology has been available now for, for a couple of years that are really making a big impact, I think, in, in, in organizations. Where are you with, with KPN on this roadmap, I would say, for um, uh, automating more of your business processes with RPA? Yeah, so there was not a top-down approach here. Mm -hmm. uh, I like the fact that it was a bottom-up approach. Mm -hmm. People were already automating, how I explained it earlier to you, yeah. to um, really make a distinction on where they want to make an impact mm -hmm. and automated all the other uh, activities. Uh, we make use of RPA and we make use of uh, AI to improve the processes. And uh, this happens on the enterprise experience side. So whether it's on finance processes, end-to-end, yeah. -end, on HR processes, end-to-end, -end, but also logistics. And also in the space of business technology platforms, uh, we have to think of uh, billing as a service, as uh, for instance, and mm -hmm. how do you... Because it's super, super complex. It's even more complex uh, than in the financial services industry. Mm -hmm. How you charge, what do you bill, how do you make that products, um, packages, uh, for instance, combining fiber, combining in-home, combining uh, Wi-Fi connectors, combining a mobile, combining, and then have it on a family. So you, we, we have our services on an address, we have us, our services in a family, connected in a package, even with OTT and TV in it. We have uh, services that are mine, uh, it's my husband's, and it's combined in a package. Yeah. So charging and billing here, the whole uh, campaigning, the whole billing as a service is mm -hmm. really complex and really smart. Yeah. So it, it really uh, is a perfect spot to use RPA, AI, but also process optimizations and mm -hmm. also real automation of use cases and mm -hmm. also how you bring your value uh, towards web because web and app are just, um, yeah, phases mm -hmm. of how you connect with your customers behind it yeah. should be the whole business logic that you can effectively automate. So many, many different use cases and, and, and application domains, I would say, for, for RPA and automation in, yeah. in, in, in general. 
here in a big organization, but it's it's more it's organized bottom up. It's not that there is a center of excellence for RPA and that 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 you you build um, a, a specific intelligence around that. It's, it's you leave it more to the different teams, right? Yeah, I think this helps us um, better mm -hmm. than when it's top down and mm -hmm. people then are stuck in a room thinking of what do we do with RPA, mm -hmm. and now. Uh, whether it's digital experience, media experience, or it's enterprise experience, or via means of business technology excellence or yeah. tech-based excellence, uh, people utilize it for the outcome that they dream of. Yeah. So, Arti, let's talk about uh, your IT organization and, uh, and KPN, 11,000 people. How big is IT? Uh, how is it organized? What's the IT operating model? Yes, so within the TDO, so Technology and Digital Office, I think maybe 3,500 people are um, within TDO. Out of that, uh, that number, thousand of it is, uh, is working in technology solutions yeah. for consumer wholesale and enterprise. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it's uh, a thousand people uh, within my team. And how have you organized your team? How is that? I mean, you have to, the five experience and uh, expertise yeah. uh, centers that yeah. you talked about. So you have my position, then you have staff mm -hmm. positions and staff positions are not there to just be staff. They're mm -hmm. really uh, forward looking positions that ha have to really change mm -hmm. and uh, internally, but also towards our uh, colleagues in the company. For instance, portfolio management mm -hmm. or uh, holistic products and roadmaps, uh, architecture, yeah, architecture yeah. and these type, type of uh, staff functions that mm -hmm. can really help me uh, structure and bring value to our own organization, but also yep. connecting with others in the outside world. And then you have the five experience centers, and within those teams, there are multiple teams. So it's governed by an IT director yep. uh, that has uh, his teams working in self organizing teams, and these mm -hmm. self organizing systems contain of IT managers uh, working in multiple. Uh, teams of the combined product owner, scrum master, DevOps teams. Every DevOps teams is like uh, five to eight persons large or small. Mm -hmm. And then you can handle uh, five of those teams. Okay. Uh, so that's more or less how we are organized. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is that product owners are a family. So even if that product owners of media experience are there, but pro they are a family with product owners in digital experience and are a family with um, enterprise experience and other, uh, so, and the same for the Scrum Masters. So even though they sit in one of the five experience centers, mm -hmm. it's also true that within their acumen, so uh, product owners, Scrum Masters, De De DevOps engineers, they are effective communities and they gather together yeah. to bring their craftsmanship forward. I really love the system and how it's set up because it really helps people, for instance, the product owners with really a view and a vision of their mm -hmm. products, the Scrum Master, really on the philosophy and the uh, uh, the burn rates yeah. and the sprint goals and the DevOps engineers really building those services and an IT manager really helping the system be more become more and more and more self-organizing and, and, and sort of like the healing the systems and bringing it forward and then governed by the IT directors but still there's lots of families so product owners across these experience centers are families, scrum masters are, and engineers are. Oh. I love that system. Good. Yeah. Now, you're now, what is it, 10, 12 months in, in, in this job? You have huge experience in finance. How do you, and so you have now a good view, I think, uh, to compare these two different sectors. Yeah. Banks, insurances, telco. How different is IT? the role of IT, the organization of IT between these two different yeah. sectors? I was already uh, in uh, contact and conversation with KPN, but also other companies mm -hmm. when I was working at NN Group as an international CIO, I was working with larger multinational companies and also with KPN. And mm -hmm. I, I really loved to make the switch to telco because it's, I was uh, I was almost uh, becoming uh, 50, I was 49, mm -hmm. and then thinking of, okay, 
am I going to, I'm, I'm now 25 years in the financial services sector with banks and insurance company in the middle of the night, yeah. you can wake me up and I could explain to you how the architecture, infrastructure, processes, even everything on the law regulation part works. Uh, it's time maybe to shift sectors before mm -hmm. I uh, become 50 years old, which was a, a strong conviction, but it's not true. You, can, you do not have to change sectors. So I thought it was nice to seek a position in a sector where in technology plays a core and an instrumental yep. part. Uh, it also does with banks and insurance mm -hmm. company, as I've proved with yep. setting up digital natives or improving multi-country banks or whatever. I proved that the technology is really important yep. there. But my next step, I thought so it was I, good to change sectors. And, and so how is it different and how is it the same? Yeah, Good question. I love this. And uh, I love this question because you can see people from telco mm -hmm. uh, oh, advance like Bauke. Uh, like Bauke. Okay. Yeah. So advancing their careers in uh, ING or in uh, banks and insurance companies. And you can see people from banks and insurance companies advancing their career in, um, in telco. For instance, yeah. in this case, we have multiple um, board members within KPN that are effectively out of the financial services sector. So it's a little bit of, I want to change sector, but I do not want to really uh, say goodbye to my whole um, career and everything I learned because mm -hmm. from uh, infrastructure, transactions, architecture, it really looks the same. Mm -hmm. it, whether it's your uh, billing system or it's your uh, insurance company core systems with all of the policies in, uh, it really looks the same. Yeah. Also the challenges to reinvent themselves, it lo really looks the same. The only part that I really love and is really change, is a huge change, is that yeah. it, within telco, the core is technology, the core is digital and uh, the business is technology. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now you talked a lot about um, your agile teams, your scrum masters yeah. and, and so on. So, so it's clear that running an agile organization and, and, and organizing IT in an agile way and with agile teams is, is high on the agenda. So, so how far are you with that? And, and, and um, if, if we look at what the Agile Manifesto was written, what is it, 10 years ago or something maybe? Yeah, yeah it, it is, let me see, yeah, it is uh, 10, 11 years ago when yeah. the Agile Manifesto had so much impact in a uh, global uh, level, yeah. also by means of Spotify and all of those, yeah. uh, and also large banks in the Netherlands. Yeah. ING has a really huge effort in Agile, and also KPN made in the same time. My predecessors really implemented Agile, and it's already there uh, and so also, how do you see this evolving I mean yeah. is this now the, the de facto standard I don't model, think so or? I think don't think so you have also now if you uh, you can watch the whole movie or you can uh, check the the, the the snippet or the the picture today mm -hmm. in the picture today we have seen and also with outside companies that you can effectively change this to a hybrid model mm -hmm. wherein traditional project management or portfolio management can sit together with agile teams, mm -hmm. having product roadmaps and having programs can yeah. sit together. And also uh, sometimes if you take a look at and assess agile organization, you see that it's shifted to fragile organization because it's really hard to manage and to align them with each other. Mm -hmm. That's why it's a little bit went back to uh, being in the middle saying, we are working in a hybrid way, we are working agile, but also uh, with project management and we sit, marry the whole, um, all of the methods. And also we, we, we don't want it to be a be all method. Mm -hmm. It is a method. It's not, yeah. so agile is not the outcome. Agile is a method when yeah. you work. You have to really be really keen of what value does your method bring yeah. and, uh, and try to be open to new methods. So a thousand people in your, uh, in, in your teams, so you have to make sure that they perform, that they create the value and the results. So I uh, understand that your focus and, and KPN in general is very much around creating high performing teams. Yeah. yeah. Can you tell me a little bit more about that and how you manage the performance of, uh, of people here? Yeah, so I really want to 
uh, stress that this is really important for, to me, mm -hmm. uh, that high-performing teams and understanding high-performing teams and also uh, building for high-impact organizations. Mm -hmm. So we have introduced, by means of our HR corporate department, high-impact organizations, and that high-impact organization is cascaded down through the whole organization. I love the fact that if you try to understand and debate with each other what is a high impact team or what is a high performing team, you would immediately think that, okay, that means that diversity in styles needs to be there, diversity in capabilities needs to be there, diversity in competences needs to be there, diversity in gender, diversity in, in your background um, should be there culturally, but also uh, on, on gender. and so. so if you have an environment, a team, wherein they can be open and transparent and feel safe to say, uh, this is performing well, this is not performing, and they are open, I think that would help you forward with high-performing team. And then having that openness and that safety to say things and be open and uh, speak to each other, that also means that giving feedback I don't think brings value because mm -hmm. gi giving feedback already if a manager is giving feedback to somebody it works with the total construct that that's a manager and that's somebody receiving feedback mm -hmm. so feedback yeah I think if you uh, if it's unsolicited it does not bring value mm -hmm. if you have a system for performance management or a system for um for giving feedback, it will not help you because then you would have in your calendar to have those conversations or have those uh, feedback sessions and then you switch back to your normal lives. It's better to really uh, marry it this way yeah. that you leave it with the professional yeah. and you let the professional think of how can you make impact on yourself and how can you make impact on your team? Mm -hmm. How can you make impact for your organization? Build that framework wherein you wanna uh, make an impact on mm -hmm. self, on team and on organization and ask us to facilitate that for you. So the accountability is with you and the management of it is also with you mm -hmm. so you manage your growth you manage your uh, the level of impact that you make you reflect on your own behavior and your own capabilities and knowledge and competences and you ask us to facilitate you to become better mm -hmm. this way talent knows how to grow their own skills and knows and will ask for solicited advice and solicited feedback and solicited coaching yeah. and solicited uh, frameworks or curricula to help them grow their knowledge. I think this is the way to yeah. do performance management in the new style. Okay. Now, I'm very, I mean, you, you have come in a couple of times in, in a new organization as, as, as top CIO. Um, and, and so that, I mean, that must be a special experience. I mean, you arrive there on the Monday morning and then you have your 100 days uh, where you need to feel what is this all about? What is yeah. the culture of the company? Wow, wow, what's the, the the organization? Which are the key people and so on and so on. So tell us, I mean, and, and let's drill down maybe a little bit on, on the culture aspect. When you arrive here at KPN, how do you uh, sense the culture and how do you work on the culture? Because that's, I think, if you want to make a transformation, that's what you need to work on, uh, yeah. certainly. So, so what's your approach in there? Here with KPN, I did it differently because you always do it uh, situationally. Yes. But I always come in and I build an assessment for eight weeks, analyze and have a diligence with the assessment and then share the assessment to have it reassessed and in the if the context your environment thinks yeah this is a valid picture then okay I build my change agents and my team to let's change it for the better and let's keep what's already working uh, and, uh, and celebrate that in this case within KPN I I used a flipped classroom style. I'm not sure if you know it. Uh, so I was not standing in front of the room saying, okay, we're going to make an assessment and this is the information mm -hmm. I need. But I let them tell me who they are, 
what they are about, where they are in on their path of growth. And so I just announced with an open calendar in during the week, I am here having lunch in an empty meeting room. I'm here having breakfast in an empty meeting room. I will sit here uh, closing off my day. And whoever wants to come join me, mm-hmm. come join me yeah. and, and tell me about your organization and tell me where you are and tell me about your team. Tell me of uh, the things that are working well and the things that should uh, should we should have attention on mm-hmm. and it's really interesting because then the class is telling me how it is yeah. and after uh, eight weeks of having that flipped classroom onboarding I really assessed it and then let it reassessed be reassessed by them as well yeah. and do you see the same picture yeah we see the same picture okay I understand the movie now we see the same picture what of this picture should we change for the better and what of it should we celebrate because we're so proud of it yeah. and what should we effectively yeah get rid of Okay. Yeah. And so now after one year in this job, how do you look at your fundamentally, what is currently your role? What is, yeah. what is it that you spend most of your time on? Uh, As you already said in some of the questions that the demands are huge mm-hmm. and uh, also the, the ways of changing uh, technology to, uh, to make an impact uh, socially and with our co- uh, customer clients and companies is huge. So there's lots to choose of. Uh, this, I spend a lot of time in structuring uh, uh, these demands and also understanding what should go first and what should we do and also really delivering it. If you're saying, okay, we plan the work and now work the plan mm-hmm. to really have that in. I spend a lot of time in, in that. Plan the work, work the plan. Uh, as soon as you understand the priority and the program and the value that it brings, Plan the work, work the plan. And and then also uh, try to now for the first month um, d- embarking on a change of the organization. It really, uh, as I told you, building the, those experience centers and building these self-organizing teams and improving what works well uh, now and could be even improved further. Uh, that's a huge uh, challenge I have. And also there are new innovative programs. So... Um, becoming more digital, so digital experience mm-hmm. and a platform experience and also enterprise experience. We really want to move it for, uh, move forward with this. Yeah. Uh, that's a huge part of my uh, yeah. time as well. Yeah. So you've been in this business for 25 years. Over even. <laughs> yeah. And so if we would be looking back 10 years ago, the role of the CIO and today the role of the modern CIO, and we would try to look forward and in five, 10 years. So how do you see the evolution? Where do we come from? How yeah. do you see the, 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 the really successful CIO today? And, and, and how do you think this will evolve? I've seen a lot of peers mm-hmm. being uh, the keep the lights on CIO or be the uh, let's improve CIO or be the I'm outside IT CIO, really a business, an IT for the business, not just an IT for IT CIO. And then you have another uh, type of CIO, which is really the innovative CIO that wants to do new, ch- embark on new things and yeah. new uh, take on new challenges. And what I also see, and that's maybe who I am, more the transformative CIO. I use the transformations to come from A to B. Mm-hmm. And so I would position myself as transformative CIO. And, and a lot of other peers are also in this space. They are either in one of the examples I gave you, pushing the button forward. Mm-hmm. I think that it could be the case that a lot of CIOs that are now CIOs, transformative CIO, understanding the business as a whole yeah. that you have to do as a business CIO then uh, could effectively end up in a CEO role so more a generic or general management role let's talk a little bit about management so you have your different teams yeah. your um, uh, your CIO office I can imagine and, and so, yeah. so how do you what, what, how would you describe your day-to-day management style Oh, so I I am maybe the person that uh, sees something mm-hmm. that can be done 
in a different way and have value in a different way can be improved. Mm -hmm. uh, then seek people mm -hmm. uh, to really climb that mountain and then structure the mountain to climb on. Mm -hmm. I think that's the best uh, summary of yeah. what type of uh, yeah. leader or yeah. manager I am. And, and as a good manager, um, key is, of course, to build successful teams. And we talked yeah. about high performance and high impact teams. So, so what, what is your secret of success here? I don't mind high mistake teams. I don't mind high mistake teams. Uh -huh. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm, uh, I'm rephrasing it because uh, I am okay with failures and I'm okay with mistakes that are made and mm. I'm okay with uh, projects not going how you uh, expected them to turn out mm. because I think that those are the learning yeah. teams. So for me... High success teams are high learning teams. A high mm. learning team uh, means that you should be open to uh, projects taking longer or uh, things uh, ending up different way. No. Just don't make a repetition of your mistakes or just don't make the repetition. Learn something from it. So high learning teams and are the high performing teams in my mind. Okay. Let's talk. Let's go from 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 management to uh, style to leadership style because I think there's two two different things. So, yeah. um, um, and 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 I mean, being a top CIO means that you need to be really a, a, a good leader and be able to paint a vision where people go uh, yeah. for and, and so on. So, if if I would go back to NN or to Knabank or to uh, any of the your previous um, yeah. uh, companies. What do you think people there would say about your leadership style? How do you think I'm convinced, you're perceived? Yeah, I'm convinced that they would say she is high demanding, mm -hmm. but you cannot fool her because she knows everything on the content mm -hmm. side. I started my career as an engineer and mm -hmm. really kept on improving my record. Yeah. So I, I am convinced that people would say she's high demanding, she's a fast thinker, it's hard to keep up with her, but she's also um, really somebody that's really deep in the content and also white in the content. Yep. She's always improving them uh, herself. They would also say that she could have more attention to people. And I, I, I have discovered and I sensed that I was shifting from being always in my head mm -hmm. and being a thinker after so many years in leading roles and leadership roles, I shifted to being more intuitive and being more feeling. And yeah. so I, I do remind myself to not forget the person behind the profession or the yeah. position, because the, this is really something that I can uh, grow in. I mm -hmm. could really, while you're so hungry for results and you have exactly the analysis how to do it, yeah. you structure it uh, and you're demanding because uh, you, you want to get there. I could be more focused yeah. on the people side of things. Okay. Let's talk for a moment about, I mean, we're talking about leadership, digital leadership. Let's talk uh, for a moment about female digital, uh, digital leadership. Because if we look back 10 years ago, there were only very, yeah. very few uh, female CIOs. Nowadays, yeah. we see a, a bit more of them. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and I'm certain that we'll see uh, that grow in the future. Yeah. How, how, how do you see yourself in, in that aspect? Your, uh, I mean, you're... Uh, I would I would think for for many people a role model as a, as as a female CIO. And do you think as a female CIO you approach your job different than than the traditional male uh, CIO? Yeah, maybe ten years ago I would have answered uh, differently, but mm -hmm. today I would say that female leadership is also in men. Uh, so female leadership, mm -hmm. being caring, being nurturing, being uh, understanding the emotion, try to crack the behavior and the yeah. psychology of people rather than to just be the one managing and yeah. command and control or whatever. So female leadership is being more nurturing, caring. I think that more females in leadership roles and more females in positions of influence, that will really shift uh, us forward because yeah. I, I really think that uh, people now and, and young girls and young females, if they don't recognize themselves in positions of influence and they don't recognize themselves in board positions or C-level positions or whatever, then they will not be what 
they cannot yeah. see. So they, there needs to be role models there, but also people that are open to putting their hand out saying, I see you, come on up. Uh, we need to uh, be there more in, um, yeah, um, yeah ma males, male, so men and women can learn a lot from each other. I, I really think that we can learn from men yeah. and men can learn from us and working together more in a balanced way. And we still have a lot to go. We have a long journey to go mm -hmm. before we're in a balanced way. Yeah. But that, I think, can improve uh, leadership as a whole. Yeah. Let's, for a moment, if, if, uh, if you allow, talk a little bit about your uh, private background. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I understand that you come from a very traditional family where uh, girls were not encouraged to make a career and more or less stay at, become stay-at-home wives and take care of the kids and the family. But you didn't go for that and you uh, were the rebel and you changed that and you made quite <laughs> a career. So, so where, uh, where did you decide that you didn't want to follow the, the, what your father and mother wanted from you? Uh, great question. Uh, great question. It's, uh, I speak a lot about and, and showing my vulnerability by speaking a lot about this. Uh, so being born in a Hindu family and also in a family with three brothers, uh, it was hard to have my own voice and it was hard to be recognized for my knowledge. And even if I had good grades and it was hard to have that attention span on me as well mm -hmm. because I knew maybe not explicitly and sometimes even explicitly I knew that I had to marry and uh, become a mother mm -hmm. and um, yeah uh, would would take part in another family than my own yeah. because that's the the route that you go on but we always had computers in the home and my father was a financial project leader with one of the ministries in the hague so i was introduced to computer software and hardware on, at a young age i loved playing with it because i was always inside and and this way i could see the potential and uh, what you can do with computers hardware and software and also have a real understanding at a young age but that's quite finance. exceptional, no? As, as, a, exceptional. as a young girl to be passionate yeah. about computers. It's nothing you no. share on uh, at school. It's nothing you share with your girlfriends mm -hmm. at uh, mm -hmm. uh, when you're playing on the yeah. uh, on the courtyard of the of, of your school. It's not something you brag about mm -hmm. because it's boring. It's nerdy. It was not sexy at all. Yeah. Uh, but then that was what I could do it. So if yeah. I've done my uh, the household the uh, homework, I could do this. But at that time, you don't know that that's a superpower. Mm -hmm. Then later, when I um, yeah got married at a young age and I became a mother at a young age, but then again, uh, uh, were again alone with uh, my son, then I knew that this is a superpower, understanding IT and really understanding ahead of my, uh, of, of my context and environment and, uh, and the context within companies, understanding hardware, software and the combination of infrastructure and connectivity. I had everything in my uh, backpack yeah. and, I, and then I could really build my whole career on it and be fully independent of others. So th yeah, I took my whole life and my whole freedom and autonomy yeah. in my own hand and also to uh, build my future and yeah. And where does that drive come from? Why did you, why was it so important for you to, I mean, you've built quite an impressive career and, and, and you were not set up for it. So you had to invent yourself. And so, yeah. so what, what's the inherent, the, the intrinsic drive that that you have that brought you to do uh, yeah. to this uh, role again uh, really interesting question i've i've spent a lot of thought on this mm -hmm. i think so they are always saying is it nature is it nurture mm -hmm. so uh, my sons are saying because of the hardship and the adversity that you've gone through that's why you're so uh, high performing and mm -hmm. always moving forward and i say no it was always in my nature i was at a young really young age when nothing really was uh, there i was always that person mm -hmm. i was always wanting to be 
better than I used to be. I did not want to be the best mm -hmm. of the team or, or the best in my family, but I wanted to be seen and I wanted to be me and I wanted to be recognized. So I wanted to be better than I was before. So I, I think it was uh, nature. My son says nurture. They say that your environment and the hardship that, that you have gone through mm -hmm. has shaped who you are today. Yeah. And my, my oldest son, for instance, says, I'm so happy with everything that I have in my life and how much I learned from uh, uh, from his parents, so my husband and myself. And he is really saying that uh, uh, I'm so happy I'm not an insecure overachiever but because I see that the hardship that mom has gone through and the adversity that mom has gone through, uh, I do not have that no. um, adversity and that hardship around me. I was always happy. I was always taken care of. I was always unconditionally seen. And my youngest son also says that uh, it does not matter what he does for a living because he knows that I will unconditionally always love them. So there was also a part of being recognized or being seen or yeah. being valued. And, and my sons feel like we don't have the lack of value or the lack of recognition. Yeah. We are so loved by both mom and dad that uh, we just want to be me. Okay. Now, we're going to talk about your MBTI profile in a moment. And uh oh the, <laughs> and the interesting bit, and, and you already mentioned that, that you have moved from an ENTJ to an ENFJ. Yeah. So you've gone from a more rational to a, and, and put more value on, 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 on feeling and emotions and, and so on and, 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 and changed in that way. Now, I understand you shared with, uh, uh, with me that you've always been working very, very hard. And, and you are an achiever and, and it was important to make a big career and big impact on, on your life and, yeah. and of uh, life of people around you. But that in 2018, you had a crucial period there where you had to take a couple of steps back. And I can imagine that's where you, um, where you also made that change a little bit and became more in touch with your feelings. So yeah. tell us a little bit about that period, what happened there and, and how did you come, uh, how did you manage that? Yeah, super on point. I am convinced also that that period was uh, pivotal to mm -hmm. that shift and uh, shifting from your head to more your your system and your heart. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I said, I, uh, it felt like if I would have to draw a visual, I was always walking a stair up. I was mm -hmm. always shooting for the moon, as I say it, and always moving uh, forward and climbing steep mountains. And then for the first time in my life, I walked down the stairs mm -hmm. in me and really had to take a step back, but also pause and really spend the effort and the energy that I spent spent in climbing mountains had to uh, climb down in myself and mm -hmm. thinking aha uh, if you're always running and running and running at a certain point of time your whole um, your whole system your whole head and your heart and your uh, your whole body is saying okay now look back for the first time in my life in 2018 I looked back I never before looked back I was always somebody that was working on the day after tomorrow or next year and the future yeah. uh, and I was not good in the status quo and I was not at, not at all capable uh, at looking back and yeah. in 2018 I really thought that now I have to take that time yeah. and look and what, back. And what did you do? I first uh, studied mindfulness, mm -hmm. uh, an eight-week course, and really did it still the high achiever way, which mm -hmm. does not work, because then you know everything in theory and you're doing the practice, but you're not really going through it mm -hmm. uh, after that. But it all uh, already... There was always uh, already some benefits that I could reap from it, mm -hmm. uh, especially incorporating it in your daily life, for instance, uh, when I walk outside, I listen to the click clacks of my heels uh, and that brings me back to today. If I'm brushing my teeth, I'm always feeling how it senses. If I shower, I try to focus on the drops. In the moment, yeah. Yeah, in the mo being in the moment. But how to take that then further, I uh, uh, it was nothing... Uh, 
I would have imagined me doing, but I did a silent retreat in mm -hmm. France. And that's really where I felt like everything that I've gone through was reconciled and everything came up. And I tried to understand how was my journey until here, what happened to me mm -hmm. that were a little bit scars on my, uh, on my system, on my face. Yeah. And how do I reconcile with that uh, scars and really accept that this is who I've become and I'm proud of where I am and but but it is also time to stop running and yeah. it's time to be okay with who you are and be okay with yeah being me yeah. that's more important than what others think of me uh, so that happened in 2018 and I feel like now sometimes even if I know that rational is a better solution if I think that's harmful, I feel that it's harmful for people or it's not helping people, I would jeopardize the rational thinking and I would completely um, prioritize feeling over yeah. thinking. So you got your, your thinking and, and your feeling more in balance yeah. uh, through that uh, program yeah. that you went through. And, and I can imagine that you would advise that for people who are too much in the head and too rational to also yeah. develop in that area. I could not tell you how to get that because uh, uh, I feel like, uh, I should ask you, uh, but I feel like you have to go through something mm -hmm. to come back up and see it. You cannot see it if you don't come go through something. Yeah. So now I, if I have to make a decision, I first ask the question, how does it feel to me? How does it feel for my environment? Mm -hmm. Is this something we should do? And I rather than saying, ah, it looks good on paper and it it's a sound decision because we've computed it and let's just do it. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, hard for binary IT engineers <laughs> to be more on the feeling side. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit about your MBTI profile, which is nowadays ENFJ. ENFJ, so extroverted, intuitive feeling and, and, and judging personality, threats and uh, that's that profile is also known as the protagonist and these are warm four tri types that love helping others and they tend to have strong ideas and values and they back their uh, perspective with creative energy to achieve their goals and i'm gonna uh, read a couple of typical strengths of, uh, oh, wow. of uh, enfjs <laughs> And you tell me where you recognize yourself and you say, maybe can give an example of, of how that yeah. really illustrates who you are. So Ooh, protagonists, nice. ENFJs, the ENFJs, they're typically very receptive. They're open to, uh, to listen to other people. They're very reliable. We can count on them. They're very passionate in, uh, in, in what they do. Um, altruistic and also charismatic. So of these five strengths where do you recognize yourself most? maybe passionate uh -huh. the most i think out of this i recognize all of them mm -hmm. but if i have to choose one of them i think it's uh being so passionate also has a drawback mm -hmm. uh, because people would say why is she so passionate and so hard going on uh, things could she slow down a little bit uh, but i would definitely say passionate and I, i'm passionate about so many things mm -hmm. and um yeah I will come back to that in a moment. Mm. But every profile has a, a, a strength, but also weaknesses. development areas, yeah, weaknesses, of course. the yeah. flip side. So people with your personality type, sometimes they can be unrealistic uh, in, in their expectations. They can be overly idealistic. They like to explain things and sometimes they can be condescending in the way that uh, they do this. Um, they can be too passionate, they can be too intense. In, uh, too in, intense, <laughs> I recognize. In the way they approach their, their life and their business and they can sometimes be overly empathetic. You already mentioned to... Um, I recognize all of these uh -huh. weaknesses. I really recognize all of these. Uh, I would say if I had to choose one of these, I would say unrealistic. Okay. Yeah. So you, I really naively think that we should really shoot for the moon. Mm -hmm. And even if we fail, we will still be a star. And this is sometimes unrealistic. So sometimes I, uh, I draw a future or paint a, a picture of the future yeah. saying, we should do this. And then it's too 
um, unrealistic mm -hmm. um, and, and it's hard to achieve. So I think that, um, yeah, I would love to be more in connection with reality mm -hmm. and not be that idealistic. Um, I think that also the condescending part, I, I, mm -hmm. I, I really recognize so, all of so the... So how do you work on that? How do you make sure that, because you can't be condescending if you work with... Too yeah. much if, uh, if you want the people around you to be happy, right? Yeah, this morning I had a super nice conversation with one of the board members at KPN. And uh, I asked him, uh, should I be less passionate? Because mm. I can also see that being so intense sometimes uh, is not received well. And I love the fact that he responded and said, you are best if you're you. Yeah. Uh, so just be you. Mm -hmm. prioritize being you uh, and I love that about him but these are all things that you have to work on so my team now will say if they can convince me and they do on a regular every hour they convince me to do things differently I would now accept their reality mm -hmm. uh, more balanced uh, view of what's realistic, what's not, what's achievable, what's not, and work with that. And my last teams would say, she would never, uh, she would never accept if we would not go shooting for the moon and climbing high mountains. Mm -hmm. And now I balance it a no. little bit more and I let my team convince myself. So I, I admit a lot that, ah, I was wrong. I reflect a lot. Ah, Maybe I've uh, seen it a different way. Maybe I should uh, do it differently. And I also uh, do a lot of retros. So I say, okay, I did it this way, but did I do it correctly? Could I have done it differently? I also reached out to my former teams asking for feedback. So I think I'm more in the learning space now rather than just saying, this is me, please world. Um, deal with me. Deal with me. <laughs> and now I'm saying, yeah, I know who I am, but yeah. can I really um, listen more to what the environment wants me to be? Okay. Achti, let's go one level deeper. We talked uh -oh. about, yeah, it's, it's a leadership <laughs> deep dive that we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go to the, um, to the values level. I mean, I'm convinced that success uh, comes because people are passionate and they have a drive and, and, yeah. and they live by certain... Um, conditions and, and they have certain characteristics and personality. But I think we're all very driven by the core values that we that we stand for. Yeah. So, so you have, you shared with us, you have two, uh, two kids, um, two sons, 29, 21. Uh, so what are the values that you have passed on to, uh, to, 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 your, um, to your son? So what are the core values that you live by yourself? We are super, super close. So mm -hmm. me, my husband and our two sons, we are super, super close. So um, it, it's, they would definitely, if you give them a ring, say mm -hmm. that she's always uh, been really vocal on to the outside world and to others, do good. Mm -hmm. And uh, for yourself, do better. Uh, because I don't think that uh, I may be hardball on this saying, okay, uh, what do you think that you want to improve? This, um, out of these three things that you picked, which of them will have the biggest effect? Well, this, and then commit to it, do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I'm maybe a cheerleader, a coach, and these values, uh, I really stress being a coach, a cheerleader, and a creator, but always saying, do good to others, really be a good human being. Being a good human being is already super complex, and also do good uh, or be better uh, for yourself, not for others but for yourself. I don't mind. My oldest son is a cloud engineer. My youngest is studying business management, mm -hmm. but I don't mind what they do. I just want them to uh, do good for others yeah. and not, f not be so individualistic and also be better at who they want to become. Your work is clearly your passion. Your family is clearly your passion. Yeah. 
Definitely. What, what are the other passions in your life? The things that really drive you, that get that get you up, that get you excited? It must be playing golf and playing, playing piano. Golf. Playing golf and playing piano. Uh, so I, I remember I was also this intense and high high mountain climber, high achiever when we were building the first ever digital native bank. Uh -huh. And then the CEO on strategy day said, you have to pick a hobby now because <laughs> Uh, we, we cannot keep up with you. You have to pick a hobby. And I said, well, I love listening to Ludovico and Naudi. Do you know his music? No. It's um, a pianist, best-selling pianist today, uh, sold out across the whole world, uh, really earns a lot of money because uh, all of the Hollywood movies have his Ludovico? piano music. Ludovico Ainaudi. He's an Italian pianist. Mm -hmm. He started playing the piano at 40, go imagine, oh. and now is the biggest selling uh, pianist. If you ever have the chance to go to his concert, really do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I sat in that strategy meeting and said, okay, if I have to pick a hobby, I want to play piano, I want to play Ainaudi, but I've never played the piano. And then um, out of the bonus I received of that job immediately, or uh, my, my piano was funded by Knobbank, mm -hmm. and I uh, played the piano and okay. I started to learning it. And my goal was to play Ainaudi. And um, yeah, I love it. Yeah. Okay, so you started learning piano on a later age? 40. At 40 as well? Yeah. Well, that's quite amazing, yeah? because yeah. typically it's something that you need to learn and, and yeah. it's because it's muscle memory and yeah. so on that yeah. you need. And, uh, yeah. Okay. No, it's really nice because if you're playing piano, you're doing 10 processes with your brains because you're using your fingers, you're listening to the melody, you have to take account of mm -hmm. the timbre, you have to take account of the speed, you have to really uh, play it in such a way that the message of that uh, piano piece comes across yeah. and there's no space to think of work. So I love playing the piano. I also love playing golf. I also started playing golf at 40. Uh, I just was injured a few months ago with my wrist, so and I'm uh, recuperating or in recovery yeah. of it. So uh, I I started playing piano again, okay. but after my injury, but I did not start playing golf yet. I have to really sit this year out, but then uh, get back in playing golf. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about the um, the important people in your life. I mean, of course, outside the family, <coughs> your husband, your children. What are really the important people in your life, mentors, people that you learned from? And can you give an yeah. example what you learned from who? I used to always learn from people that were really critical on me. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I was a people pleaser, so I really... Uh, they really shift people that were critical of me or saying no to me or really having um, a lot of feedback on me. I really was close to them because I could learn via them or by them. And now after uh, I've, I've wised up, I try to really learn from people that are already examples in the world. For instance, I'm not sure if you know her, but Karine van der Leyen is one of the first Dutch ladies that went into Harvard mm -hmm. in a time in the 80s where no females were there. And she she also worked at KPN in a senior leadership role, but she's, she also founded her own company uh, around the 19th. Uh, it was called Women Capital. And she was really trying to enhance uh, female leadership and females in leadership roles yeah. in the corporate space. And she knew everyone and she was really an advocate for diversity before we used the word diversity. I really learned by her. She's still my mentor. If I really want to understand something, uh, she knows a lot about office politics, but also how do you build your career? How do you advance your career? Mm -hmm. uh, she was also the one saying, okay, it's time now for supervisory boards position. So now I'm, now I'm besides my uh, normal 
job, my executive role, yeah. I have non-executive roles, uh, supervisory board and advisory board roles. I really perceive her as a mentor, but at the same time, it could also be Oprah Winfrey that inspires me. And it could also be somebody I meet on the street mm -hmm. and says or has a conversation with my myself. There are so many people that inspire me yeah. um, and I can effectively learn from everyone. Yep. Are you a mentor to some some younger people maybe as well? Yeah, I'm asked to, so I mentor uh, young females in technology. So mm -hmm. they're just newly grads and uh, starting their careers. I'm also a mentor to senior leaders or senior managers, uh, female leaders, mm -hmm. that I have a, a network built uh, of hundreds of females that are working in a technology space. And I also try to, uh, not just talk about it, but just do, just put people in positions. Mm -hmm. Because I really think that um, uh, people in my position should have an influence in shifting yep. and breaking this barrier. And, and also, I like the fact that, uh, as you said, in the 80s, in the 90s, in the 2000s, I've gone through a lot of hardship in corporate life, and I could now effectively mentor others yep. to stay in the game and not because they endure the disappointment, get out of the game, yeah. s stay in the arena. Yeah. Arti, you have uh, won quite a number of awards already in, 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 in your career and, and you even had a speech on Dutch television where you talked about social purpose. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. What, is that. what does that mean for you? Why is that important? Yeah, I learned, uh, this is also something after the interview we have to speak about, but I learned that if you've gone through hardship, people come back up and then always want to make an impact and have a higher sense of purpose of being and br what do you want to bring to the world or what do you want to leave behind. So I really think that, uh, yeah, this is a huge change. The purpose to making social impact for me is really important while choosing my next employer, I chose KPN because mm -hmm. KPN has it really ingrained in their DNA that they want to make a social impact yeah. whether it's on security for the Netherlands connectivity for the Netherlands digital services for the Netherlands or even outside they really want to change the professions of, of in the health sector or in smart cities or a, for a teachers education by means of the services that we have mm -hmm. so having my personal position of making a social impact and also working at a company that wants to make a social impact really really important to me okay in your professional life uh, you've um, created quite a lot of success but we all make our mistakes of course lots of them yeah so could you would you care to share with us Arti what was maybe your most brilliant failure professionally and, and, and what you learned from it? Oh, my most brilliant failure. Uh, my most brilliant failure. Mm, I would say I cared too much. So I took myself too serious or I took a program too serious um, that I would not do anymore or it's still something I work on. Mm -hmm. uh, my brilliant failure, for instance, was an outsourcing deal which uh, gone sour. Uh, so for several countries uh, at a company I worked in, we had to source mm -hmm. uh, capabilities, competences, and activities, and really by use of the sourcing and the transition of the sourcing, uh, innovate and be more able and capable of innovations. In the midst of that uh, sourcing program, uh, the, the company that took this activity was under a lot of scrutiny on their own side try to really uh, deviate from the results and uh, mm -hmm. of this uh, program. I took it really personal. And I, I really think that, uh, yeah, it was really hard for me to say this program is not gone well. And what did you learn from it? I learned from it that by making a U-turn, we could get to the end result okay. faster. Sometimes you're so married with, I've seen, this is the path. To, be co to come here uh, in the midst of that failure of the program going sour by thinking, so using your yellow power of making analysis and uh, I could see that, hey, we're already there during the transition and they're not there, but that's okay. We just make 
a U-turn and then try to become there. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge failure. I took it really personal, but then really seeing what, not seeing as a mismatcher what's not there, but seeing what is there, I, we're already good to go. Let's um, deviate from this outsourcing deal. Let's really uh, build it for ourselves and do it differently. We really could uh, do it and, and be there faster okay. than after the sourcing deal. It was a brilliant failure in hindsight. <laughs> it didn't feel like a brilliant failure at that time, not at all. Yeah. Back to your personal life, what would you say is maybe a big thing or even a small thing, what would you say is the best thing that has ever happened to you? Yeah, that, that's also a brilliant failure. So uh, I was really young when uh, I was married and I was uh, a really young mother, but I also got divorced at a really young age. And um, you would say, well, well with violin m music on the background, what a sad story. But this is actually what helped me regain my autonomy, regain my freedom and really... Uh, I think if I would have been alone, I would not have be so achieving. But if you have to take care of uh, somebody else, as you said in my profile, I love helping others and being altruistic for others. I had my beautiful son, so I, I this this is maybe. Uh, my best experience that I've gone through that difficult period of time, and by that, uh, yeah, really could um, change my whole life and change my whole narrative uh, because he was shining as my son, so bright, and sh it was so important for me to take care of him, mm -hmm. more important than taking care of me. For me, I could, I, I could really maybe put myself always on the back seat, but mm -hmm. my children I would always put on the front seat. What is it that you fear most and love most in your life? Brrr. Uh, what I love most is that you have so many opportunities. There's really nothing lost. Uh, sometimes people are scared of something that's uh, scary, uh, but there's nothing lost because look at where uh, I am now and look at my background. Uh, I started really with nothing and uh, I, I believe that I achieved something. Uh, so I, I love that. Uh, you can build your future the way you want it mm -hmm. and everything is achievable. You just need to really want it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, what I fear the most is losing health uh, myself or losing the health of my family. And I, that really scares the hell out of me because uh, that's not something you can control. That's not something you can manage. That's yeah. not, you can just live your best life and take care and nurture your bodies. And, and still, even if you do that, yeah. uh, things can happen. Losing health is the scariest. And um, um, yeah, what I love the most about mm -hmm. life itself is that all opportunities are there. All options are open. After you come across as somebody who's quite happy in life, right? I'm, I'm so... Maybe a strange question, but on the scale from, from 1 to 10, where are you on the happiness scale nowadays? Ooh, I think maybe 8, mm -hmm. 7 or 8, because I don't believe that 10 is there, because before it's 9, I've already thought of new things to introduce in my life that are already um, as, yeah, changing me and my yeah. environment. I'm always on the change. Um, yeah, and I'm super happy that my husband is more... Uh, steady and he's more so if my motto is shoot for the moon mm -hmm. uh, and his uh, motto is uh, it's not about the years in your life it's really about the life in your uh, years so he's really focused on bringing value in every day every yeah. week every year and I'm always changing things yeah. so um, yeah I am a seven or a nine but that could change you recently turned 50, um, so you're still very, very young in the midst of, of, of your career, but where do you see yourself when you're, um, when you're like me, when you're 60? <laughs> <laughs> you don't look like 60. <laughs> yeah. So how do, you, how do you picture yourself? Or do you ever yeah, reflect I, on that? And I, I do, but uh, at the same time, I accept that uh, plans are there to 
turn out differently. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is more the feeler side of me and the mm -hmm. thinker side would plan out the future and the feeler side just saying, yeah, whatever happens is okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so I would say I would love to really advance my career in my uh, CIO position because I, I'm a technologist and a digitalist at heart. So mm -hmm. I love my job and I love my craftsmanship and my acumen. But uh, I would also love to sit on a board on a more general position or uh, yeah, do different things. No. I, as I said, the diversity of my uh, job now is the outside non-executive roles and the inside executive roles. I would love to really see this changing, maybe from a CIO to a CEO position mm -hmm. or from a CIO to another a position, building a, a new venture again, but then with a larger impact uh, from scratch, would love to do that. Mm -hmm. Restructuring a mid-sized company, would love to do that. But also bringing outside in value to a larger company, would love to do that. Okay. Yeah. Many, many options though. Yeah, <laughs> I think so. I would even, uh, as I uh, uh, really, really believe, would could be a nice option option is really relocate, even though I work from uh, small companies to mid-sized companies, yeah. larger companies, national companies, multi-country yeah. companies and international companies, I effectively never relocated because of my sons being so important for me. But now they are adult. My <laughs> oldest one is cloud engineer, yeah. Yeah. youngest one is studying. So I could effectively make the choice to relocate. I think that would be interesting. Pretty cool as well. Yeah. Arti, you're very active in our CIO in the community. Uh, you're a, a president of the advisory board here in the, in the Netherlands. Why yeah. is why is a community? Why is networking? Why is that important to you? I think it's important to everyone. Mm -hmm. I think if I may say so, a little bit of critical note that uh, women uh, do not show up as much as they could. They could be more there in platforms and gatherings and communities and uh, CIO, CIO Net is an excellent uh, platform to be in because you're connected uh, to all CIOs, global, uh, even if it's Asia or uh, US or Benelux mm -hmm. or Netherlands, uh, it really connects people across the globe mm -hmm. and you can learn by each other. You're also connected to other. So I could, you've done this so many times. I'm here in the Netherlands. You just connect me to somebody in telco outside com country. So that you can, in CIO Net can really effectively take the role of, uh, of a connector. And I also think that year over year, you can see more females mm -hmm. connected to CIO Net. Super nice. Yeah. Actually, in the preparation of this uh, interview, one thing that struck me was that you uh, have described your, uh, your development uh, path that you developed, you used a metaphor that you developed from a lion to an elephant. Explain me that, please. Yeah, uh, I used this metaphor and tried it out to explain that I used to be an insecure overachiever, mm -hmm. always ready to fight and enter the arena because uh, the corporate life and also sitting in a posi position of CIO or within IT, it was always hard. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had my scars to prove my struggles in my personal life, my struggles in my professional life. I used to always feel like a lion, mm -hmm. strong, uh, ready to fight, ready to, uh, and also the scars of my losses. Mm -hmm. But then well, after 2018, I did not feel like insecure overachiever anymore. Mm -hmm. I did not feel insecure anymore. I did not feel that the recognition uh, or the confirmation from outside was very much needed for me. I did not feel the urge to enter into fights or uh, arenas anymore. So I felt like I slowed down mm -hmm. and I became even steadier on the ground and it felt like uh, my eyes were softer and my my whole dynamics and how I became skin was thicker probably. my skin was thicker and I was more in a family of elephants mm -hmm. than I was a loner uh, oh, yeah. uh, right. elephant so I I really felt uh, that I became or transitioned to an elephant and I used uh, I, I used my body to help others forward and mm -hmm. sit in the family and even protect younger as is, it is in the family of uh, of elephants so yeah. studying I did not feel like a lion anymore that was really interesting to me and then I analyzed 
what I became and yeah. try to share these stories to younger um, female professionals, especially in the technology. And they could really resonate that either they felt still like insecure overachiever mm -hmm. and a lion, or they felt that people around them or themselves transition to an elephant. It's a nice metaphor to use. Okay, super. Arti, thank you so much for your time, for your hospitality, for receiving us here in the beautiful uh, KPN office in Rotterdam. The last question uh, is for young people that watch these videos and I want to follow in your footsteps and that are also ambitious and I want to become a, a top digital leader. What's the advice that you would give these people? Oh, it's really hard because I, I feel like I'm also always learning and I'm uh, still on my path and my journey. But if I have to mention what comes to mind now, I would say don't look up. Mm -hmm. So don't look up to managers to grow your uh, capabilities or don't look up to others that already achieved it. Mm -hmm. But really try to figure out for yourself where are you? Where do you want to take yourself? And just do it, try it. And even if you fail, you still be a star. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that really is the, the whole advice that I can give because I recognize that. And I also did it uh, looking up and thinking of who's going to save me, who's going to support me, who's going to sponsor me, who's going to grow my uh, skills. And then I always took it matters in my own hand and that would be my advice to others. Okay, super. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was a real pleasure. Thank yeah, you, Arti. Thank you.